If we take the complications and I guess the, the whole point of the diabetes annual review and the GMS contract targets is for uh, complications screening. Um, if we take eye disease first, um, many areas of the UK would now have designated eye screening service and so the requirement for clinicians both in primary and secondary care to examine the, the fundi is thankfully reduced. Uh, the reason that screening tools such as retinal photography or digital photography, which tends to be the usual way of screening programs, the, the reason for those is that they have a much better sensitivity and specificity for diabetic eye disease than an individual clinician. And certainly um, all screening um, recommendations would not include the use of a handheld ophthalmoscope. So that is no longer thought appropriate, even in the hands of an expert diabetologist or an ophthalmologist. And so if digital retinal screening is not the uh, modality, then it would be binocular retinal examination that would be recommended. Now, the important thing about retinal screening is that patients with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes can have quite extensive changes in their retina and have perfect visual acuities. So the patient themselves will have no indicator that there's an issue until they develop um, sight reduction. And at the point when the sight begins to be lost, then the options for therapy are often very limited. And so prevention rather than cure is definitely the, the order of the day. It's worth pointing out as a result of that that you can't use visual acuity screening as a modality. So visual acuity testing is, is not good. Patient reporting is not good, and that's the reason that the eye screening needs to be done. Now, the risk of getting uh, diabetic retinopathy within five years of diagnosis are vanishingly small. Nevertheless, everybody is recommended to have yearly screening, and that's largely because yearly is an easy sort of denominator to use, and it gets people with type 1 diabetes, for example, in the habit of having their eyes checked on a regular basis. In terms of type 2 diabetes, because we often miss the diagnosis or the diagnosis according to UK PDS study is 7 to 12 years prior to presentation, then clearly these people can have diabetic retinopathy at uh, the time of diagnosis and so screening from diagnosis is an important aspect of therapy. The screening for diabetic foot disease is well documented in GMS and GMS has recently expanded its um, foot um, quaff payments to include risk status. So essentially uh, what the clinician is looking for is evidence of vascular insufficiency. So this is some sort of assessment of pulses and an assessment of the uh, sensation within the feet. And this would typically involve use of microfilaments, but uh, uh, people such as myself still use vibrations uh, uh, tactile assessment as uh, a modality. The most important thing is to actually look at the feet and it's getting the shoes and socks off in a cl clinical environment and that has also the knock-on effect of emphasising to the patients how important it is that they keep a regular um, attention to their feet. Despite this it's quite amazing how many people will have poorly fitting footwear um, will go for days or weeks without any um, attention to hygiene of the feet, have nails that are desperately in need of clipping and, and not do anything about it. So foot care education is something that needs frequent and regular reinforcement since, again, as with all diabetes, prevention is better than cure. Um, admission to hospital with diabetic foot ulceration due to vascular insufficiency or neuropathy is still a common event and it tends to be something that keeps people in hospital for a long period of time. So if we can avoid foot ulcer ulceration that's clearly important. The risk status that's now applied to feet uh, in diabetes is uh, comes with a sort of indicator as to what level of care they require. So a patient at no current risk for example so who would have preserved foot pulses and normal sensation would be anticipated to perform their own nail clipping and foot care unless there's some other reason that they have difficulty. For example, they're unable to see their feet because of blindness or unable to reach their feet perhaps because of central obesity. In contrast, those with 
um, active foot disease should be managed in a multidisciplinary foot clinic setting. Typically that would be in secondary care and then there are gradations of you know, podiatry input for those with the intermediate risk. And I think having systems that allow those risk assessments to equate to um, a routine uh, regular podiatry are quite challenging and important for, uh, for the quaff outcomes. Finally, in terms of diabetic renal disease, um, COF uh, is currently um, giving payments for creatinine, equating to estimates of GFR, and also recommends um, monitoring of urine for microalbuminuria. <clears throat> and it is actually pres uh, prescriptive in this respect, in that it would suggest the use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs in those patients. There's no doubt that uh, early detection of diabetic nephropathy, so diabetic kidney involvement, will lead to the potential to reduce progression and that's largely down to blood pressure control. So in these patients who have a progressive decline in GFR by reducing blood pressure you can slow that decline and for some patients that will slow the decline to such an extent that dialysis and end-stage renal disease never, never happen. For the more typical type 2 diabetes patient, the discovery of chronic kidney disease in that setting, either due to micro, by virtue of microalbuminuria or persistent proteinuria, is probably not highlighting that they have diabetic nephropathy, but is highlighting that they have a decline in renal function, which is probably related to large vessel disease. In this setting, there's no doubt that blood pressure control is important, but also cardiovascular protection using uh, statins and consideration of aspirin is also important in this respect. It's worth pointing out that EGFR as a screening tool um, is very often a measure uh, or an indication of age. And it will get to the point where a patient with a creatinine of one micromole above the normal range above the age of 70 will be ca categorised by the MDRD equation, which is the one typically used for EGFR estimation. They'll all be categorised as having stage 3 chronic kidney disease, so an EGFR between 30 and 60. And the likelihood of them progressing to end-stage renal disease is almost zero. So we are, in effect, creating a disease category which equates more readily to age than it does to kidney damage. And I think that's something worth bearing in mind when we try to explain to patients how they've appeared on a kidney disease register um, when, you know, in fact, we're simply going to be addressing blood pressure and other cardiovascular risk factors.